The following sermon by Robert Murray McShane is called Hell Will Be Sudden to the Wicked. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. It is quite obvious that the description here given is taken from what befell Sodom. Genesis 19 verses 23 to 25. It was a fine summer morning. The sun had just risen and was shedding its rays down upon a meandering Jordan. The women were busy about their employment. The children were sporting in the morning sun when suddenly darkness overcast the sky. And in a moment God rained fire and brimstone from heaven upon them. One moment they were rejoicing in the morning sun. The next they were well trained in the lake of fire. Brethren, I believe that the most of those in this congregation who will finally perish, their destruction will be sudden. It is written, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness, and the cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. Luke 21, verse 34. Observe these words. And so that day come upon you unawares. Compare this with the words of the text. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares. Both passages are taken from the way in which the fowler catches birds. He draws in the snare suddenly, else a bird would escape. Such is the way with the wicked. The second coming of Christ will be like a snare. And brethren, I believe, again, it is so with all of you who die without finding Christ. You will perish suddenly. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. There are among you that do not believe that there is a hell, though you read of it in the Bible and are told about it. Still you always put in as a solve to your conscience Perhaps there is not such a place after all. Perhaps it is just a bit of a priestcraft got up to frighten people with. I believe that many among you think that, and many of you will die thinking that. But oh, the moment you let go of the last friend's hand that is grasping yours, that moment, sinner, when you find your soul in the presence of God, And when you find out for the first time that you have God to do with, that moment you will find that there is an eternal hell. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. O my brethren, methinks hell would not be so bad if you were counting the cost of it. But to have the eyes lifted on it in a moment, ah, you will know what the second death is then. We come to the second proposition, and I desire you to attend to it, for it is what I have chosen these words for. It is the righteousness of God which makes him punish the wicked eternally. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup, for the righteous Lord loves righteousness. Verses 6 and 7. I believe there is a great deal of ignorance about an eternal hell. There are many men that think God will cast sinners into hell on account of mere passion. Now, it is right to know that God did not create hell merely out of passion. Brethren, if it was passion, it would pass away. But it is not from mere passionateness that he has kindled hell. And it is right that you should still further consider that it is not that God has pleasure in the pain of his creatures, I believe that God does not delight in the pain even of a worm. You will see this in Ezekiel 18, verse 23. Have I any pleasure at all that the wicked should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should return from his ways and live? And then, verse 32, For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore turn yourselves, and live ye. You will observe in this chapter that you have it put in two forms. You have it put in the interrogative form, 
and then you have it in the affirmative. Again, we are told in the New Testament that God will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. He is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3, 9. In Acts 17, 30, it is said, God commands all men everywhere to repent. These passages show that there is an essential benevolence in God, that he has no pleasure in the pain of his creatures. Speaking humanly, God would rather that the wicked should turn from his evil ways and live. Some will ask, why then is there a hell? The answer, brethren, and it is an answer I desire to be written on the heart, it is that the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. The only reason why God casts the unbelieving into the fire that never shall be quenched is because God is a God of righteousness, and therefore he will reign till all his enemies are put under his feet. Perhaps, brethren, some of you will say, why does his love of righteousness make him punish sinners in an eternal hell? There are two answers to that. First, sin is an infinite evil. And therefore, it demands an infinite punishment. I don't know if you understand this. The thing I was praying for in secret was that I might be enabled to vindicate God's proceedings. Then, brethren, sin is an infinite evil because it is the breaking of an infinite obligation. I suppose there are none here who will say that God is not infinitely lovely. And therefore, none will say that there is not an infinite obligation upon us to serve him. Then if you and I do not this, we are breaking an infinite obligation. And if it be an infinite evil, then it demands infinite punishment. But how can man bear infinite punishment? If God were to put an infinite punishment, who could bear it? Therefore, it is eternal in duration. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares fire, and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. I said there is another answer to this question. How is it a righteous thing in God to punish sinners eternally? You know, you would not care what a criminal said at the bar whether his sentence was just or not. He might probably say it was not just but you would believe the judge. Now God says, it is a righteous thing. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 6 Sin, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. You will observe it is said, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And how much more then will everlasting destruction be righteous? God's whole way is equal. God who holds the balance in his hand says it is a righteous thing. Dear brethren, I pray you in God's name to think of this. If punishment come from the righteousness of God, then there is no hope. If it were out of passion, then it might pass away. Often you observe a man whose face is red and swollen with passion, but it passes away. But ah. It is not out of passion. If it were out of passion, surely God would have some pity when he saw the sufferings of the lost for many ages. But ah, no. From what then does it proceed? It proceeds from the rectitude of God. If God can cease to love righteousness, then the fire may be quenched. But as long as he is a righteous God, that fire will never be quenched. Oh, brethren, it is a foolish hope you entertain that the fire will be quenched. I have seen some on their deathbed thinking that the fire may be quenched. Ah, it is a vain hope, sinner. God will never cease to be a righteous God. God will do anything to save a sinner, but he cannot part with his rectitude in order to save you. He parted with his son in order that he might gain sinners. But he cannot part with his righteousness. He cannot part with his government. He would need to call good evil and evil good first. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness.
But come now to the last point, and that is that the very same rectitude saves a believer in Jesus. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. I think this is the meaning of these words. His countenance beholds the upright, Psalm 11.7. The same thing is spoken of in the passage we read in Thessalonians. It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, and so on. The same thing we are taught in 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And it cleanses us from all righteousness. It is not said he is merciful, but he is just to forgive us of our sins. The same thing we are taught in the first and second verses of the 40th chapter of Isaiah. Comfort ye. Comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably unto Jerusalem, and cry unto her, that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Here God puts the pardon of Israel on rectitude. Her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Why? because in her surety she has received double for all her sins. Suppose, then, a sinner was to come to the surety this night. You will observe that the sins you have committed are doubly paid. If the curse had fallen upon you, you could never have exhausted it. And therefore, upon the ground of equity, she has received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. He is just to forgive us of our sins. His countenance beholds the upright." My dear brethren, in impressing the subject upon you, I would speak, number one, to those of you who are believers, dear brethren, you were once condemned to this hell. Over this hell you walked, but God has brought you to a surety where you have received of the Lord's hand double for all your sins. Prize this surety. Ah, brethren, it is better to be saved through Christ than even if it were possible to be saved any other way. For not only are we saved, but God's rectitude is displayed. Prize this surety, then. Number two. I would say a word to those of you who are under concern about your soul. I am glad there are any concerned. Oh, that I could say all were concerned. But, dear anxious friends, this is a hell you are going to by nature. I would say then, see the necessity of fleeing from it. Many will say there is no use of all that anxiety. There is no need to fear. But, dear anxious soul, if you have understood what I have been saying, you will see the necessity of a thousandfold more earnestness. Ah, it is a fearful hell, but oh, it is more fearful to think that it is kindled by the rectitude of God. Ah, then, there is need to flee. Ah, dear, dear souls, do not be turned away by the world's flattery. Number three, let me speak to those who are careless. My dear brethren, I have shown you a solemn truth tonight, and unless I knew that no truth in itself will convert you, I might think that you would be converted by what you have heard. I showed you that the destruction of the wicked will be sudden. Dear friends, do you think that it will be sudden? The very fact that you can sit so easily shows that you do not believe it. Therefore, when hell comes to you, it will come like a snare. Ah, dear careless soul, think when you go home tonight, what if it should be tonight? This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Luke 12, verse 20. Careless sinner, what would become of you if God were to shoot his darts and rain snares, fire and brimstone upon you? Ah, tell me, sinner, would it not embitter your eternity to think that you were told of it? Ah, you were like Lot's sons-in-law. He seemed as one that mocked unto them. Genesis 19, verse 14. How do you think they thought it a dream when they lifted up their eyes in hell? And, O sinner, will it not embitter your eternity to think that you had been warned to flee? The minister is free of my blood. 
I was warned, but I did not heed. I am the cause of my own undoing. My hands made to snare wherewith I am caught.